So you feel comfortable deploying containers into Kubernetes. You know how to wrangle YAML, but you sort of squirm when people ask you, how does run C work? What's a C group? How do the container D shims work? Well, in this video, I'm gonna to help to fill you in on those gaps around those technologies. We're gonna have some hands-on examples. I'm gonna to talk to you about the lineage and the context of why these technologies exist. And at the end of this, you're gonna feel a bit more like an expert when it comes to answering those questions. C groups, also known as control groups, came out in 2008 in the Linux kernel 2.6. And since then, they've evolved from V1 to V2. The primary distinction between that is around how the hierarchies work and how controllers work when you remove one from a hierarchy. I'm not gonna to go too much into that today, but I'm gonna take you through the fundamentals of just how C groups work, what do they do, and why are they powerful? But before we go there, let's just talk about what a C group is. So it is a kernel feature, and it allows you to manage and allocate system resources. Uh, these resources we can describe as subsystems or controllers in C groups. And the processes that we're associating those with can also be known as tasks. So I could define a process or a task as having a certain subsystem attached to it, such as the CPU. And within that C group, I can effectively create a bubble of allocation. And this is really important because critical systems and services are given the time and the resources they need just as much as other applications can be limited from what they take. Now, C groups follow the Linux process tree. So you have the init process at kernel boot time, and then that starts all the other processes in that tree. But because all the processes descend from a single parent in the Linux process tree, it's called a single hierarchy or tree, right? So you visualize these things almost as tree, almost like file systems, as we'll go on to, to see later on. A similar thing to the Linux process tree is that C groups also can inherit attributes. Uh, so a child C group will inherit certain attributes from their parents and so on and so forth. And that means that we can start to think about how do we have subtrees within C groups. So let's just take a little look at how would I even create a C group. So I mentioned here a little bit about V1, V2 C groups. I'm going to just assume that we're using V2. So we're going to use um, sysfs and we're going to call it and we have something like um, sorry uh, c group we're just going to call this cube pods this is a c group that exists for kubernetes for example now in that c group all i need to do to create a c group and to work with it is to make a directory so i can call that c group one right and then you think oh what do i do now well then what i would need to do is to put the pid of my task in here so i could have a file called tasks and what I could then do is capture the PID of my running process into there. And that is the, the bare bones of how you would actually start off a C group or start that process being managed by that C group. I'm not going to go too much into the implementation. This is more an exercise around the theory of how this works. But what I want to show you is that fundamentally it's based on very time-worn and very foundational Linux principles. Okay. So let's have a quick look and scroll down and so what are some of these principles of C groups that are really important. So we think about this box in the middle as being sort of a file system, and that is our slash C group name. Each one of these is a sub uh, child underneath it, so C group one and two. And what we do is we associate these somehow with a task, with a PID. These are the subsystems, as I mentioned, a subsystem is, is, a, is a controller uh, and vice versa. So in this case, it might be the controller for this CPU or this bit of memory we need to start thinking about some rules because this isn't a free-for-all. I mean, there needs to be a structure in this universe. So the first rule is that a single hierarchy can have one or more subsystems attached to it. That makes sense. So I can't attach the same subsystem twice, but I can attach each subsystem once independently. Now, the second part of that is that any single subsystem, such as CPU, cannot be attached to more than one hierarchy. This box, again, is also called a hierarchy, like a file hierarchy. So if one of those hierarchies has a different subsystem attached to it already, so what you can see here is that I can't attach my CPU to both my hierarchy on my right and my hierarchy on my left. This is, you know, because we're already attached to a hierarchy, and if we want to attach it to another one, we cannot, because it's a logical constraint um, to, pre to prevent us from doing so. For any single hierarchy you create, each task on the system can be a member of exactly one C group 
in that hierarchy, a single task, maybe in multiple groups, as long as each of those C groups is in a different hierarchy. As soon as the task becomes a member of the second C group in the same hierarchy, it's removed from the first in that hierarchy. At no time is a task ever in two different groups in the same hierarchy. So you see this red line here, no, t no time would that ever be the case. So let's rewind this maybe to a, a real world example. If you're running um, Nginx or um, you know, HTTP proxy, something that uses the HTTPD process. Now, you may well have a CPU attached to that a subsystem, a memory subsystem, and a network subsystem all attached to restrict, say, to 15 megs per second, whatever. Now, the problem here is that because the hierarchy is such that um, C group 3 and 2 at the, at the same hierarchical level, that task cannot be a member uh, of two different C groups. So therefore, that is restricted. This is a bit of a trickier one conceptually to get your head around. What I will do is in the links is I will put some examples and some resources so you can take this at your own pace. Again, my example there being an application like a web server or something running as a process is split. Uh, its processes are split into different C groups. Equally, this last one, if you're using HTTPD or something similar, there are processes that, that will fork themselves. What happens to those? Well, in this principle of C groups, they then fall under the um, originating C group that they were forked from, right? So if that process was forked in C group one, it stays within C group one. That doesn't mean it cannot be moved to another process group. So after that, it's free to then move to another process group if you so wish to do so. So that is effectively what C groups are. I went a little bit deep there and there might be some things that I only briefly covered. There might be others I went a little bit too deep into. So let's just sort of take a, a step back and think about what C groups let you do from a top down, right? So because a task can only belong in one single C group in any one hierarchy, there's only one way that, that task can be limited or affected by a single subsystem. That is a logical feature, right? That was a decision that was made. You can group several subsystems together, so CPU, memory, RAM, so they all affect tasks in a single hierarchy. Okay, so processes in a single hierarchy. Because C groups in that hierarchy have different parameters set, those tasks will be affected differently. And it may be sometimes necessary to refactor a hierarchy, right? So an example would be removing a subsystem from a hierarchy. Uh, it might have several subsystems attached to it and attaching that to a new separate hierarchy. And you'll start to see this is where some of the tooling comes in. And this is where you start to think, oh, I don't want to do this manually anymore. This design allows for C group usage um, to be done by setting a few parameters such as CPU and memory um, and attaching the subsystems and making it very actually easy to work with. The design also lets you have specific configurations for each task, right? So each process on a single system could be a member of each hierarchy, each of which has a single attached subsystem. So a configuration would give the system admin really high fidelity over every single process. Now we've looked at control groups, it should be pretty evident that modern containers as we know it are still a way off from that, right? Control groups give us a way to allocate and manage the resources on our system, but they don't give us that file system layout and the option to bind different types of interfaces and mount other types of directories and whatnot in. That's really where tools like Run C come in. So Run C was devised by the Open Container Initiative. It is a reference implementation. There are other types of execution engine like cat containers, etc. And what it attempts to do is to provide a very streamlined experience for the lifecycle management uh, of a C group based process. So I'm going to take you to an example straight away here. So on the right of my screen, I've created a directory. What I'm going to do is create a root FS because one of the requirements for run C is that you have a root file system. And this is really the first point we're starting to think about what is a modern container? Rather than creating that from scratch, I'm going to reverse engineer this. So if we docker export, um, and then we're going to go docker create uh, busybox. And what we can then do is to take that, oops, and I should probably try and redirect that uh, properly with the right flag. Oh, pop that in there. And then go tar c root fs dash x there we go and so what that's going to do is it's going to cr cr uh, grab the busybox image down and 
pull it into this directory called rootfs. So rootfs is a requirement to run C, and inside of there, you could place a binary, your process that you're going to run, or anything else that you want to be containerized. The next thing you need to do is to run run C spec. What is runc spec? Well, this provides you with this config.json. Now, if you've used Kubernetes, you've probably seen a lot of parallels here, right? Capabilities are things that are in Kubernetes directly. So, for example, uh, cap kill, sysadmin, etc. You've also seen that you've got things such as mount points in runc. Runc allows, enables mount points as well as other types of Linux namespaces. So, Linux namespaces are a topic unto themselves, but I'll just think of one, like network namespaces. You need to be able to share the root network namespace with your container network namespace to create that VETH pair. Um, I had a video out on Flannel a while ago, a CNI, which goes into more detail. Equally, you share namespaces uh, between processes and uh, other mount points. And so this effectively is a bill of materials for what this container is going to do. Once we've then decided we're happy with it, we're going to do something like run C, run C group one. Uh, and I'm just going to pseudo that. And now you can see it's executing my container. Now I've decided to run it uh, in foreground rather than in background. But what's really exciting there is that we are effectively using run, uh, run C and C groups to manage this container that I have created. Now, you can do something similar with a different kind of container. Remember, the busy box entry point is shell, and that's why you go straight into the CLI there. You could use something else like Node or Golang, um, and you would actually just have the response return. Now that we've looked at run C and control groups, and we have effectively a modern container as we know it, there are still a lot of things that are missing, such as images, right? Pushing and pulling, uh, being able to talk to Kubernetes, being able to use different execution engines. In fact, Run C is very much just an execution engine, and it's focused just on how does it manage the life cycle of those C groups. That is where we start to look at ContainerD. ContainerD came from Docker. So that's the relationship there. You have the Docker daemon, the ContainerD daemon, which is invoked, and then that then manages Run C and control groups. Docker really did influence this space heavily and were really the pioneers for much of this technology. In fact, when the OCI, so the Open Container Initiative, was formed part of the mandate and the influence from Docker was to create some new open standards around this. And this is where such things as CRI also came into play, so the container runtime interface. By creating these vendor neutral abstractions, we're not pinning to any one technology. And whilst run C, yes, it's the default technology in container D to be run as the execution engine, it is underneath the shim. And that is where we're going to get into the architecture. So effectively, what you can see from right to left is container D with a bunch of shims and then the C group management aspect underneath. These shims are abstractions, they're decouple, uh, decoupling layers from the actual execution engines. There are a bunch out there, right? There's the NVIDIA runtime, there's GVisor by Google, there is um, a run C as we've mentioned, and several more like CADA containers. What container D does is it manages the images being pulled down, being decompressed, loaded into a file directory and then having run C execute on it. So this is a whole other topic as well, but you will see that there are such things as Docker overlay layers, um, as well as other types of file system references when you're dealing with containers. You'll see between container D and CRI container D is you have gRPC, so there's a gRPC endpoint. And this is effectively the interop between the kubelet and the container D daemon. We started this video looking in some depth around C groups, around the policies and restrictions around the creation of C groups, and some of the concepts around them. We then looked at how run C as a utility makes that way more accessible. And in fact, we could run a container that looked pretty much like a modern application workload with relative ease. And then we came on to container D and looked at how those containers that were being run could be scheduled and organized through a daemon that talked to Kubernetes, hence something like container D. What I'm hoping is that you can take away that these various technologies all work together to bring you modern Kubernetes. Think about run C operating on lots of distributed machines with several components on top. Of course, image decompression, scheduling, logging, uh, placement, admission, etc. But the fundamentals here are that you are effectively running 
C group processes of those file systems, so those rootfs based containers that have an application in it on a piece of hardware somewhere. I hope that this has been useful. Please do like and subscribe and send me any questions my way. Thanks. Mm -hmm.